Well, what I'm going to talk about for um, an hour is um, the archaeology of the Silk Roads. Um, it'll have quite a strong Central Asian flavour, as uh, has already been pointed out. That's very much where my background and research work has taken place. But I will touch upon much broader issues, including the maritime uh, silk routes. If we have time, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Central Asian Archaeological Landscape project at the end. But let's see how long this takes to get through, because unsurprisingly, the Silk Roads is a huge topic, um, both chronologically and geographically. And so we can't really hope to to touch upon all of its facets uh, in the hour, but I'll try and, and give you some of the issues and flavours that I suppose are, are perhaps dominating research at the moment. As you all probably know, the term uh, Siedenstrasse or the Silk Roads was uh, effectively coined by a German geographer uh, in the 19th century, Baron Ferdinand von Richthofen. In fact, it's recently been demonstrated that the term was in circulation before he used it, um, particularly at conferences and seminars and scientific meetings. But he's the one who um, first put it in print and therefore uh, really opened up this idea of using one particular commodity, silk, um, to reflect the scale and complexity of trans-Eurasian trade. Um, as we all know, the Silk Roads is neither a road, it's many, many routes, and we'll look at some of the uh, issues about that. Often not a, a physical road uh, in the sense that we might think of it today. And it's not just about silk. Many, many um, goods were moved along the, the Silk Roads. And <coughs> um, the importance of the Silk Roads lies far beyond simply the economic exchange um, of goods and trade, but we'll explore that. However, the term has really stuck since that 19th century, and particularly early 20th century um, uses and explorers brought the, the word Silk Road or Silk Roads into very common parlance. And now there's a whole raft of books um, using it as their title in some way or another um, and reference to it. It's become very much that sort of common um, parlance. And it's also got into um, popular culture and literature. Um, the brilliant Silk Road of Pop, if you ever get a chance to see it, a fantastic um, uh, film about the impact of the movement of music and modern music in Urumqi and Kashgar in Xinjiang. Um, so there's a whole variety of uses. And so whilst we might say the Silk Roads, you know, it could be the rhubarb road, it could be the spice road, it could be the cotton road, it could be the step road. There are many, many different terms we could use for this complex set of interactions. But the Silk Roads is probably the one that's stuck and has the, the largest uh, usage today. As I said, it, it really developed, particularly with the late 19th and early 20th century um, explorers. So people like Oral Stein, Sven Hidden, Albert von Le Coq, uh, <clears throat> particularly looking at those areas of Western China, as it is today, the Taklamakan uh, Desert and the cultures and civilizations around there, the discoveries of the libraries at Dunhuang, um, the literature that that created and the excitement that that created um, very much catapulted the idea of the Silk Roads into um, common usage. We would also, particularly in the context of where I work in Central Asia, need to recognise the impact of Soviet um, scholars, particularly uh, Mikhail Ivanovich uh, Masson, who was professor of the Institute of Material Culture in St. Petersburg uh, 
and he really established Central Asian uh, archaeology uh, and the research of the Silk Roads, and his son Vadim Masson carried that on. And a variety of teams trained under the Soviets, um, particularly through their Academy of Sciences, in uh, based out of Tashkent, which was the hub for Central Asia, but with local um, branches in each one of the Soviet republics, producing some some really fantastic archaeologists in the 20th century, like Galina Pugachenkova and Zemira Osmanova, who really um, put Central Asian archaeology on the map. Sadly, not as much as it should be because of the isolationism of um, the Soviet Union during much of that 20th century period. But one thing that we're striving to do now is put their fantastic archaeological work and scholarship really much more firmly back on the map. But what this also led to um, is the development and the accentuation of Orientalism as described by Edward Said. Um, and so books like Sir Richard Burton's translation of uh, the Arabian Nights created this idea of the erotic and the exploitable East, which kind of fitted into the colonialist traditions of the British, the French, the Soviets, the, the, the German empires. Um, and so there's a kind of complex layering, which is, I'm sure, something we might come back and talk about later in terms of how this colonialist and orientalist archaeology done both from the European end and from the Japanese end and Chinese end has impacted on the way the Silk Roads is perceived today. And indeed, China's more recent uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, um, as you're all very well aware, has put the Silk Road again front and centre in terms of the way the narrative, the historical narrative of the Silk Road might be being used and exploited to justify and underpin 21st century economic, political and cultural um, exchange. And um, I really recommend Tim Winter's book, if, if any of you um, are interested in this, his book on geocultural power uh, on China's quest to revive the Silk Roads in the 21st century is a fascinating read into this complexity of how the Silk Roads is interpreted um, within the context of modern politics. But I'm going to try and talk a little bit more about the archaeology of the Silk Roads, um, the cities, the caravanserais, the port, the trade, and so much more. Um, <clears throat> And to do that, I really want to think about the, the ancient context, the realities of the of the Silk Road. It's um it's diversity. Unlike perhaps um, some of the aspects of the UNESCO project at the moment for the serial nomination, transnational nomination of the Silk Roads, which is about following very much the UNESCO's agenda of building peace in the hearts of people, looking at intercultural dialogue, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And the Silk Roads on face value would seem to be a very strong candidate for that, that cultural exchange, the dialogue, um, the patterns of interaction that have taken place over thousands of years. In practice also, of course, the Silk Roads was about war and empires and conflict and attempts to control that trade, to manipulate it, to isolate certain parts of the route at the expense of others. And so we need to move away from what is a laudable 21st century UNESCO agenda of, of that intercultural dialogue when we're thinking about the archaeology um, and the narrative that that presents of the Silk Roads. So the chronology. Well, um, for the UNESCO project, again, there was a choice about narrowing the nomination process to the period at which perhaps the Silk Roads 
over land this is, had the biggest impact upon societies, cultures, uh, the development of different parts of Eurasia. But in practice, um, the Silk Roads has been there for a long time. If we think about the Silk Roads as being this process of interaction, of dialogue, of movement of peoples, exchange of, of both goods and ideas, we can certainly see that the exchange of horses and meat uh, for grain and cloth has been going on since at least the fourth, fifth millennium uh, before the common era between nomadic societies and sedentary societies and agro-pastoralist societies right the way across Eurasia. We've got the movement of bronze metallurgy, for example, um, the techniques of it, of it being used, not just the objects themselves, but the actual knowledge about how to work with that metallurgy, moving from the Caucasus across into the steppe areas from 2900 before the common era at least. But again, it's not all um, easy. There was tension, there were raiding, there was sometimes coexistence between nomadic and, and sedentary societies, sometimes conflict over space. And the movement of peoples, uh, the dislocation of peoples was not always uh, a pleasant thing. The movement of societies uh, and peoples into new spaces, bringing them into conflict with existing uh, occupants of that space. One thing we looked at in, in a project which was published in Nature uh, with Michael Fraschetti was about the routes and the way that the later routes within the Silk Roads were very much following a lot of the transhumance patterns of uh, nomadic and semi-nomadic peoples within Central Asia. And, and unsurprisingly, people understood how to navigate these landscapes for local and regional reasons. And so as longer distance trade started to impact, they knew how to move across these complicated landscapes. Another example of that early interaction might be lapis lazuli, mined in northeastern Afghanistan um, and found, for example, within Indus Valley civilizations by the mid eighth millennium uh, before the common era. Beads of, of lapis lazuli are found in Neolithic burials in the Caucasus, um, right the way across Central Asia. The famous funeral mask of Tutankhamun, <coughs> pardon me, from the second millennium uh, before the common era, has a large amount of lapis lazuli from Afghanistan uh, within it. So over this period, high value, high prestige goods could move either through trade or through diplomatic exchange over really quite considerable distances. We can look again in the second millennium uh, before the common era, at things like the Assyrian network, um, which stretched from Ashur right the way into Anatolia, a network of roads, a network of interactions. But it also reflects that movement of different types of material and the exploitation of different natural resources. So areas where silver and gold could be mined, areas where copper is mined, areas of good wood production, wine production, agricultural productions, textiles, tin, copper, being produced in different parts of their empire uh, and networking <clears throat> and being moved around within that system. The UNESCO project took the start of the Silk Roads, and I use that in kind of adverted commas, to really be the second century before the common era. Uh, and the moment where Emperor Wu Yi from uh, Han, Shang'an in central China, central western China, dispatched uh, an envoy into Central Asia to open up diplomatic contacts, in part uh, in response against the, some of the nomadic incursions from the north, Honglu, but also to open up access to, for example, the fabled horses of Central Asia. And the feeling for that project was really, it was this um, opening up 
uh, around about the second century BCE, which really changed the nature of so many societies. So it's not that contact hadn't been taking place before, but at this point, those that scale of interaction was beginning to shape elite society. It was shaping access to raw materials. It was economically changing the scale of middle distance um, exchange systems. And as such was beginning to have that really fundamental impact upon how societies were developing along the Silk Roads. And there's no time within this uh, with this hour to really think about the whole complexity of, of empire systems that existed across um, <coughs> Eurasia from the Roman and Byzantine empires at one end to the Chinese dynasties, the Schiller and the Baijek in, in the Korean peninsula, uh, the dynasties in, in Japan, the developments in South Asia and Southeast Asia and around the Red Sea. Over, over 2000 years, there's many different empires rise and fall, compete, um, change their boundaries, push back against others. And different empires found different ways of trying to deal with trade and exchange at that time. Very famously, the Roman Empire uh, in its conflicts with the Parthian Empire looked at how it could develop Red Sea trade, trade with Western coast of India uh, and the Kushan Empire as a way of bypassing Parthia. So rather than getting expensive goods like silk, coming through the Parthian Empire, was there a way around that um, which they could exploit so that they weren't economically trading with someone that they're also at war with at various periods of time. And that's just one example of these complex tensions that took place between empire systems over the two millennia, um, even since the second century BCE. And change over that time also needs to think about how the world and the environment changed over that period. We're very conscious uh, today in, uh, in <clears throat> the context of the climate crisis of how much that is changing societies, how it's putting pressure on different sorts of agricultural production, on drought, on the availability of water. And this is something that has been oscillating over the last two millennium. We've got the Roman warm period, the late antique Little Iron Age in blue there, the medieval climate anomaly, which pushes the temperatures up, the Little Ice Age again, dropping the temperatures down, and then the recent warming. And all of the impacts that this has on empire systems, and there's a paper there on the right-hand side of the screen cited a, a recent paper looking at how this changing uh, <clears throat> climate might have impacted on the collapse of Eastern Turkic empires in the in the seventh century of the common era. <clears throat> and indeed, we need to think of this very um, interesting backdrop to trying to understand the Silk Roads the complexities of the landscapes over which this passed and the ecological zones. The agroecological zone map on the right uh, and the Coppinger Geiger map, which is very good, um, are very useful for thinking about different types of soil, climate, rainfall models over time. And as we know, the Silk Roads reflects this steppe land, these deserts, these high mountain valleys, these fertile plains, oases, river deltas. And, and these not only impact upon how one can move across these landscapes, but it also impacts on what size of population you can sustain, what you can grow, what kind of animals you can raise. And one of the advantages, a very good paper by uh, Christian in 2000, really highlights this idea of trans-ecological interaction. If you can grow something, 
which 500 kilometers away you can't that gives you a commodity to move to exchange for something that 500 kilometers away they can grow um and so we see this impacting both on the types of landscapes as i said that the silk roads traverses but also the way that one can travel across those landscapes the complex routes the high mountain valleys um, the desert looking for water water fundamental issue about how most of these routes are constructed and developed and when we were mapping the silk roads as part of the UNESCO project for the ICOMOS thematic study in 2014, it was really fascinating to look at that diversity of, of possible routes. Sometimes it's very restricted. Those mountain passes, for example, through Srinagar or, <clears throat> or somewhere like that. Um, where there's relatively little choice about where you could move through those mountains. And yet in many other places, a vast diversity of routes. Famously, in the Taklamakan Desert, do you go north of, of the desert or south of the desert? Because that's where you can find water, you can find settlements. Um, but at times of the year, you can pass through the middle of the desert, particularly moving north-south. So the seasonality of movement. And one thing that I'd want to, to really stress out of that is this idea that the Silk Roads is too often characterized as some interaction between East and West, you know, very famously between the Chinese and the Roman Empire, so the Han and the Roman or the Tang and the Byzantine worlds. And whilst that interaction is extremely important, it only works because the centre exists. You know, that lost heart of the world, Central Asia and South Asia, this interaction uh, is not passive as well. It's not just things originating in China that end up in the Roman world, like silk, um, or things going the other way, like gold coinage. But it's actually about everything that's produced in the middle, in South Asia, in the step zones that is being moved outwards. Um, two examples here from where I work in, in Turkmenistan. The, the guy on the, on the left is holding dried melon. And the ex-president Turkmenistan, um, Turkmenbashi, is holding a melon for National Melon Day in the middle. Now, obviously, you'd think melon can't move very far as a as a as a heavy uh, fruit that's going to um, decay relatively quickly. However, once you've dried the melon, like the guy on the right, it lasts pretty well forever. It's incredibly sweet. I think quite disgusting, but um, in a world before sugar was very easily available, a really interesting and sweet commodity. And indeed, there's a there's a documentary account of a caravan train arriving in India in the 14th century and someone running down because they want to buy up the dried melon that comes from Merv in, in Central Asia because the Sultan has a very sweet tooth and he wants to be able to buy it up and give it as a gift. Um, to the Sultan. So things moving from the centre to the south, different sorts of commodities. The shot on the right is uh, Damascus steel. So sword makers in Damascus, in Syria, are uh, making these beautiful swords for which the steel has its name. But the steel isn't produced in Syria. The steel is actually produced in Central Asia. It's where it's mined, it's where the technology of folding it with carbon produce this high carbon uh, steel. And from there, it's moved out. So it gets its name from how it's reworked into these swords, um, but that's not where the production is taking place. And one thing we need to really think about very strongly with the Silk Roads is not to get trapped into this um, Orientalist narrative of East and West. The Silk Roads is about complexity. It's about all the peoples who lived in India, 
in Central Asia and Southeast Asia, um, on the steppes, how they all interacted within this process. And the process only works because of that interaction. Indeed, we can also see that in, for example, the maritime uh, routes, which develop over time. And, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk very much about them today, just because we're trying to cover so much. But many, many complex factors impacted upon how those routes developed. Thousands of major and minor ports and huge coastlines and hinterlands. And we'll think a little bit about how that actually works and develops from coastal uh, interactions to um, cross ocean interaction a little bit later. Oh, in fact, no, nope, I'm going to do it now. Um, so, I mean, the dominant thing is actually uh, the monsoon. Um, as you'll be all well aware of in India, the significance of the monsoon for when you can travel, how you can travel, which directions travel is most effective in, had a massive impact on sailing times of when you would move across the Western or the Eastern Indian Oceans, how you would move through Southeast Asia and up towards China. It would dictate how long you had to be away for. Um, a lot of changing over time, as we've talked about before, with the waxing and waning of the importance as different empires controlled them. So, for example, the growth of you know, very important uh, empires within the Malaysian and Indonesian spheres controlling the Straits of Malacca um, had a massive impact upon what was being traded and how that impacted upon societies. How ship technology changed from early hugging coastlines, um, staying within sight of land for navigational purposes, but not really having the types of ships which were able to, to cross oceans. But as that change un became understood, that ability to, to navigate further this is a really lovely piece of work done by um, Arani de Saxi. Um, this is her, comes from her PhD work, which I, I'm hoping is going to be published fairly soon, where she's looked at the networks of interactions, particularly in the Western Indian Ocean um, um, and across into Africa and Arabia looking at the quantities of uh, material being moved, the types of ports being used, the types of goods, and all of this coming out of the Periplus um, historical sources, which she's um, done some amazing investigation of. And obviously today, this is modern shipping. This is shipping being tracked, and you're all well aware of you know, that impact of shipping coming around the Indian uh, ocean up through into the Bay of Bengal, crossing through the Straits of Malacca, the, the interactions in Southeast Asia, obviously the impact here of the Suez Canal in terms of the movement uh, up the Red Sea, but also the, the, the Gulf areas of Iran and Iraq. And now with the advent of, of really from the advent of the colonial period and then particularly steam power, the um, the routes around the Cape. What all this is really showing is that, that, that there is a very complex, again, network of interactions and ports. I want to think a little bit about what's moving now, and, and particularly the archaeological evidence for the goods, the materials that move along all of these different roads and the way that they may have been being exchanged. And I have a favourite little poem, Cargoes, by John Macefield, but I think it kind of captures in some ways one of the issues about what's moving along the Silk Roads. He has his uh, Queen Kareem of Nineveh and um, the lovely things of ivories and peacocks and sandalwood and sweet white wine. These high value, high prestige goods that are moving, be they by land or by uh, later by the maritime routes. So we have things that are worth transporting long distances, 
because perhaps they can only be um, produced in one place. For example, silk initially, whilst the, the Chinese held on to the knowledge of how to make silk, <laughs> until that knowledge spread, if you wanted silk, you needed to get it from China and it could travel very long distances as we know. Um, high quality glasswork, for example, the amazing Sasanian glasswork being produced in um, what is modern day Iran, but found in burials in Korea, in Japan. The fact that Sogdian glasswork um, from the areas around modern day Uzbekistan and Tajikistan framed in China for the quality and color of the glass. Um, later, you know, the movement of high quality porcelains like this amazing uh, Celadon uh, Song Dynasty picture from the late 10th century moving uh, right the way into Central Asia and into Europe and this demand. So very valuable things passed probably through many different hands on their journey from China to the Roman Empire um, through Central Asia, that, that glass from Central Asia making its way all the way to Korea and Japan. High value exchange, some of it economic, but some of it also associated with diplomatic exchange, um, gift giving, <laughs> tribute between empires, so lots of ways it could be exchanged other than purely economic exchange. We have things like spices, which excitingly, archaeology is getting better at actually looking at um, the advent of and the development of much better environmental archaeology, particularly across um, Eurasia, is really opening up our understanding of these sorts of data where they're coming from. The, the work at Baraniki, for example, very exciting in terms of looking at material that's coming from South Asia, from India, and from Southeast Asia uh, into the Roman and medieval world. And the value of that material, I love this uh, pepper pot um, from um, East Anglia, found in a hoard dating to around about the, the, the fifth century, perhaps late, fourth century, but it's it's showing how valuable pepper is. Pepper's not something for putting away in a cupboard and using in a, in a culinary context um, for the majority of people. It's a valuable commodity by the time it's got as far as Britain and it's being displayed here. The, the owner is showing it off at their dinner party about you know, I've got pepper, I can afford to buy pepper. Um, this is an elite um, exchange system. So as we know, these things change over time. Silk changes as the technology moves away. Uh, we start to get silk being produced in the Levant, for example, excavating in Beirut. We had early Islamic um, silk production sites and mulberry, uh, evidence of mulberry growing. So things can move. The quantities of spices that can move as maritime trade um, developed, bigger ships, better navigation, um, able to cross oceans, changes the accessibility of the material <laughs> and the value of material. We can think of other commodities like salt and tea. I mean, the, the famous um, tea and horse routes across from uh, Sichuan regions of China down into places like Myanmar, Bhutan, Nepal, India, the movement of salt from the Tibetan plateau. Valuable material worth moving considerable distances. But as John Macefield's poem goes on to talk about, Cargoes of tying coal, road rail, pig lead, firewood, ironware and cheap tin trays. But actually, that's what drives a lot of trade, not the, just the bundles of silk, which might be being sold on and passed on and some sold, but also the more regional and local trade. So here we can see, for example, some really nice tin glazed pot in the middle. Um, 
10th, 11th century material being produced at Mur, huge manufacturing production um, outside the city. And here we're finding this material being consumed locally. It feeds the, the local market, as it were. Um, but it is also found 500, 700 kilometers away from Merv. So it's worth trading a distance. It's worth moving, even though it's heavy, it's well produced and it's worth trading over those sorts of distances. But it's not worth moving thousands of kilometers because you run into other people can produce pot and it may not be quite as good as that one, but it's good enough. And so the difference between that really high quality porcelain, let's say coming from those um, those kilns in China in the Song this dynasty, as opposed to this good quality. The metalwork there on the bottom is being produced in Talgar in Kazakhstan, uh, excavated there. And most of it's for very local production. You can see axes and metalworking tools and tongs and, and agricultural implements. But the candlestick on the right hand side is much better quality, much farther work. And that again is found 500, 700, 1000 kilometers away from Talgar. It's worth moving over those regional distances as opposed to um, just those high quality goods. And so we can imagine loads of, of material in caravans being made up of a mixture between high status elite things that might be being sold on to move very far and things that are, are much more local. And again, going back to the environmental archaeological, there's so much more in terms of agricultural produce. I mean, this is just a shot of a market stall in, in Turkmenistan, but those pistachios, some come from local ones in the in the um, Kopitar Mountains, but other ones come from Tajikistan and Iran, even today. The different qualities, there's slightly different variations. So you can buy the cheaper local one, or you can buy the better quality Iranian plateau ones. <clears throat> and we see that within the archaeological evidence. And as again, one of the really exciting things, I think perhaps one of the, the most exciting things really over the last decade has been this explosion of environmental archaeology and also DNA work and ancient DNA. So for example, the work on Dorian Fuller's work at, at my institute, um, looking at things like rice domestic um, spread of rice production, peach domestication and spread, the wonderful work being done by Robert Spangler um, uh, and his very good book, which I Fruit from the Sands, uh, which looks at the movement of different sorts of foods. And, and again, if we want to think about how the Silk Road changed society, Food is really a fundamental issue in that. Changing cuisine, introducing new ways of cooking, new materials to cook. So how much do these things move as commodities and how much do they end up moving as plants and being grown in different places? And the wonderful uh, Schaefer book on the golden peaches of Samarkand. Again, another fascinating book looking at these um, complexities of interactions. And of course, the Silk Roads is important to us um, archaeologically, not just in terms of trade and exchange and the economic impacts it had, but also this whole movement of technologies and ideas, that moving of silk production. So by 300 of the Common Era, Silk's being produced in Japan. By 522, Byzantine Empire has silkworm eggs. They begin to know how to make it. They don't make it as well as the Chinese make it for a while, but they begin to be able to produce that. Things like the movement of, of ideas. So the amazing scholarship of the Islamic world, you know, Al Biruni's work on the phases of the moon. Um, Ule Beg's observatory in Samarkand, you know, this knowledge that was being developed uh, in that world. But the impact that that had, that movement of that into, into South Asia with, again, some 
phenomenal early observatories being constructed within India. <laughs> and of course, you know, we couldn't talk about the Silk Road without thinking about its impact on the movement of belief systems and ideas. So the spread of Hinduism, Christianity, Nestorianism, Judaism, um, Manichaeism, these impacts of, of movement, sometimes moved by missionaries, sometimes moved by the movement of people, either traveling um, to relocate as part of trade or being pushed into relocation to avoid persecutions. But perhaps the most famous, of course, is, is the spread of Buddhism out of the Gangetic Delta, um, you know, and it starts in Lumbini and, uh, and Nepal. That movement through um, the Gandharan regions up into Bactria of Central Asia, through there into, into China, into Korea, into Japan, the maritime spread of it and interactions into Southeast Asia, but also the fusions, the changes, the different um, types of, of Buddhism that develop, and in part through their interaction with other belief systems like Confucianism, um, and how that flows back into, into India as well. And archaeologically, leaving us you know, phenomenal monuments that you're all well aware of, but these amazing Buddhist sites um, across the Silk Roads, allowing us to look at the development of architecture, the development of practice, the development of, of different strands within Buddhism, but also how it's used by local societies, how it's adopted. Is it adopted broadly? Is it adopted by the elite? The patronage, it's very interesting, Some, something like the Dunhuang um, monasteries. Um, how did they become so rich to be able to construct such amazing works of art, hold such phenomenal libraries, etc.? So the patronage, the trade that's passing through, um, merchants contributing towards it, but also the attitude of, of the elite towards support of these um, monastic foundations. We can think about transport and infrastructure, how things moved, the mechanics of horses, camels, boats, people. Certainly the domestication of the, of the camel radically changed what was possible um, in terms of quantities of material and the ability to move across certain terrains. But so did horses, as again, the tea and horse routes um, <clears throat> through the highland, parts of the of the Himalayas and people. I love these amazing photographs of people carrying tea in Sichuan province in, in 1908. And now uh, porters in Nepal still carrying huge loads here, largely to avoid customs posts rather than uh, than it being the only way of moving uh, materials. But nevertheless, the ingenuity of societies to how to traverse these complex landscapes. And of course, the scale changes radically when one gets ships. This is the uh, amazing Song Dynasty Nanhai number no. one, uh, excavated from the South um, China Sea and lifted from there and excavated in a museum near Guangzhou. Stunning material. Uh, and again, we could we could talk for hours just about about that. We can think about the infrastructure that is left archaeologically, bridges, watch stations, forts, and of course, caravanserai. Um, here are three beautiful, but very different caravanserais um, from across Central Asia. So we can think about how those work. And again, we could talk for hours about how uh, they reflect the impact of the state in controlling trade and taxation, how much they reflect the scale of merchant activity uh, and the scale of economic exchange systems. When we were working in Turkmenistan, uh, out of Merv, we did a lot of survey work looking between Merv and Amul on the Oxus uh, River. And my colleague, uh, Paul Wordsworth, did a lot of survey work out there 
looking at these amazing desert caravanserais, which enabled people to be able to traverse uh, the Karakum uh, desert between these two, made that, that scale of movement uh, both feasible, but also you can see the scale of resources. These are um, 11th, 12th century uh, Seljuk double courtyarded caravanserais, the, the first courtyard for storing your, um, feeding your animals, stabling your animals, any transshipment. The second smaller courtyard, but with larger rooms around it, the residential uh, areas where you would be able to eat and bathe on your journey. But what this says about the scale of infrastructure that the Seljuk Empire, for example, in the um, 11th to 12th century is putting into managing uh, these transfers. We can think about the wealth and the power that's generated by the Silk Roads. Uh, and across Central Asia, we can think about the cities that grew up, famous cities like Samarkand and Bukhara that you've all heard of. But this amazing architecture that develops during the Timurid period of the 14th, 15th century, these phenomenal uh, buildings, but on the back of the wealth generated within those empire systems and in part by that trade and connectivity. Cities like Palmyra in the, uh, in the Syrian desert, um, controlling the routes across that desert between um, the Euphrates and the Levant, and the growth there of a, of a major mercantile class as seen on these wonderful funerary monuments. Sadly, many of them damaged during the, the ISIS uh, civil war and, and insurrections in, in Syria. Um, but many saved, thanks largely to the, the curator who was actually executed by ISIS for not revealing where much of this material had been hidden. We can think about the, the great cities of Central Asia. Here's a little group from um, Kazakhstan, like the wonderful opera, Otra or uh, Sorum. All of these largely abandoned uh, at the time of the Mongol conquest to be replaced by other, other cities and centers. And this is Merv, and I just you know, wanted to show, and this is a little um, drone flight running along one of the walls of the of the city and you can see the moat the town walls the defenses this is 10th 11th 12th century um inside the city these large green areas are in fact big harns and caravanserais inside the city wall the huge scale of cities that could be developed um during this period and indeed cities both large and small are vital to understanding the nature of the journeys. Very few people traveled from one end of the Silk Road to the other, if there was a, an end. It's why people like Ibn Battuta or Marco Polo's accounts are seen as so unusual because they were unusual to travel such long distances. And whilst there are accounts of that, much of the uh, activity was people traveling a few hundred maybe 500, maybe a thousand um, kilometers, exchanging, setting up communities. So we've got, for example, the Sogdian community in Dunhuang. So people from Samarkand uh, area, Afrasab as it was then, you know, going to uh, as far as Dunhuang, about a thousand kilometers, setting up a community there, buying up material, setting up caravans to go back to Sogdia. Um, exchanging their material, moving on further west or south or north and going back in the opposite direction. So this very interesting set of relationships. And it's why <clears throat> in the UNESCO World Heritage Nomination Project, we were very keen to not just have the spectacular um, big cities. In some senses, they could be World Heritage sites on their own. Places like Merv and Samarkand and Bukhara are it's actually the smaller market towns. It's the places like Kalgar. It's the settlement outside of Dunhuang, not just the cave site, which is actually really 
instrumental in understanding how these systems worked. And that, in for the same way, that's why the caravanserais are important. That's why the forts and the bridges matter to understanding how these networks um, formed and operated. We can also look at, at other sorts of evidence. This is the amazing from Afrasab, what they say, uh, Samarkand. This is the wonderful seventh century uh, Sogdian Hall of the Ambassadors. And, and one of the nice things is the top image um, showing Chinese envoys to the Sogdian court holding bunches of silk. And the drawing down on the bottom left is actually a style, is a drawing based on that showing more clearly and holding these little rolled bunches of silk that are being brought here as a diplomatic exchange. But there is a lot of commercial activity. We know later you know, the urban harms, these wonderful ones from places like Aleppo in, in Syria. Um, the scale of material being moved requiring this sort of urban warehousing, redistribution networks, the ability to cope with large quantities of people, the souks, the infrastructure to resell, to move material that has arrived in into a local economy, into a local market and a local market system. And there's a very good book by Peter Bang about, about markets, looking at Roman markets, but particularly looking at ethnographic evidence from um, later medieval and post medieval Indian markets to think about how these work and, and operate. And at Merv, where we were excavating, the, the main shot is part of the, the palace complex that was in the middle of the, at the city, the Dar al Ismar at the uh, Abbasid period. But in the Seljuk period, um, a new citadel was built on the edge of town, which is the sort of central shot on the left. Uh, and when the palace is moved out there, the old palace becomes a bazaar in the centre of town and we have metalworking uh, evidence. And so this palatial area is repurposed into the centre of the town. We can also look at, at how these infrastructures work. And so this is, for example, the amazing irrigation systems at Otra, which allowed that city that I showed in one of the earlier slides to actually produce sufficient agricultural produce to support that scale of population. And we have a similar thing at Merv here. Another little video shows it's flying along what is in the middle, which is the Majan Canal. And as you can see, it kind of wiggles through this landscape and we're coming up to the gate of the town and you can see the mausoleum of Sultan Sanjar in the distance, which is the center of the town. So you've got as far again to go um, the other side of that. But what this canal was doing was using an earlier uh, irrigation canal we excavated across it. So at the bottom of this sequence, we have a Sasanian irrigation ditch for farming. This is on the opposite bank of the river to the uh, Sasanian town of, uh, as it's called now, uh, Gyrkala. Uh, and what they do in the Abbasid period is to canalize this to put in brick um, sides to it, to be able to manage the flow of water into the city, to provide water for the urban uh, population. And it's a really stunning sequence. It's, it's published if you want to look at, at some of the material from it. Um, but incredible water supply system into the town, a really phenomenal structure. And we've looked at reservoirs across the town, pipe water systems um, through the medieval town. And something that Tim Ingold calls the, the temporal rhythms of life. But this is a shot from Bhaktapur in, in Nepal. But it's just thinking about how still today that journey to the reservoir, the well, to collect water for washing, for drinking, for eating, for cooking, for everything that you need to do, also becomes part of the social structuring of the fabric of the of the city. And I think is is um, such an interesting way of us thinking about urbanism. And I just finished by saying a little bit about ports, because 
Portland archaeology is so important. It's critical to our understanding of ancient trade and, and interregional interaction. But we really lack very much systematic work on harbours and ports and docks across Asia. Part of that is because successful ports carry on being used and tend to destroy the earlier ports within them. So if you look at somewhere like Shanghai, it's very hard to find the earlier port. But there are failed ports. There's ports that have silted up. There's ports that have been bypassed as technologies change. And they're particularly useful for us. They allow us to think about how they work as collecting centers for manufacturing, for transshipment, for the hinterlands, how they functioned in terms of uh, consumables, accommodation, refitting, their spiritual engagement, the entertainment, the not so savory sides of ports, its taverns and its brothels, as cities, the consumption and sustainability, how they work within food supply, and we can think about this archaeologically by looking at workshops and marketplaces and elite houses and ordinary housing and in customs and administrative buildings. And there has been some very good work starting to be done, for example, within India or along the coast. There's been a lot of effort, particularly on that, that western coast, looking uh, at ports that had Roman connections. And, and there's been some good books. Roberta Tomba's book is particularly um, good at looking at some of these connections, but there's so much more to do to think about. Here's a lovely map of Portuguese enclaves along the northwest coast of India in circa 1630, and it just shows you the scale of different settlements, different ports marked in different things, different landmarks that are being used as navigational um, aids. And navigational aids, I would I would bow to the, the amazing book by uh, Himishu Ray um, that she's done on coastal shrines and transnational uh, maritime networks across India and Southeast Asia, published quite uh, recently. And that, that idea of looking at navigation and shrines, this integration of ocean going routes and inland riverine routes where the rivers meet the sea, and also these places as centres of pilgrimage, but also how they interact with a maritime uh, community. And I'm, I'll finish now, as I've used up my hour, I'm, um, and just thinking about how archaeologically, it's really trying to get to grips with this complexity and unpacking it, and moving away from those stereotypical narratives of either silk or east and west, or a road, but rather trying to understand different communities and how they've evolved and developed and changed and interacted. This is the wonderful city of, of Bhaktapur in, in, in Nepal. And as archaeologists, but also as heritage professionals, we need to think about how our narrative of these Silk Roads um, cities and developments plays into how this works for holistic planning of protecting that heritage, but also protecting the 21st century communities who live in and around the heritage. And again, back to Pura, I think is a really good example where the local authority works very well to harness the power the heritage and the narratives of the Silk Roads have to attract visitors but to maximise that, not to destroy the lives of the people who live there, but to use that resource to help sustain it, to help um, it flourish into the 21st century. And I think that's one of the real challenges we have all the way along the Silk Roads, is not to see it as some sort of fossilised um, tourism, but instead to look at how it talks to the communities um, today.